morning. Today is that morning that the weather was perfect, 59 degrees. It's kind of like a spring day, even though we're supposed to think that summer is here. Summer is almost here and uh, might be time to go out to the creek. Might be time to take your kids on a nature trail walk. Might be time to take your kids around and learn a little bit about the rocks in Georgia. And last night, we are going to share something today with y'all that I'm very excited about because the daughters of the rock man actually did a, a great presentation last night at the Ball Ground Historical Society and we're going to share that with y'all in just a little bit. But we're going to share some other things with you because yesterday, because we were busy as bees, you get the drift, busy as bees yesterday, we could have done a two or two and a half hour show talking about bees. It is amazing to really learn how the bees operate. And I don't know if you know it or not, but there's a lot of apple trees in this area. There's a whole lot of growing going on. A lot of folks still having gardens. We need the bees. And yesterday I was kind of wowed by all the things that bees do and to find out what it takes to make that honey. And I will tell y'all, that honey was yummy. But because we dove right into the bees yesterday, we didn't get to share some photos of the storms that came through Nelson the other day, that came through Tate, that came through Jasper. I think a little of them came through Ella J. We had some storms. And if you think life isn't comedy happening right before your eyes, I closed on a house Friday for a young man. I went by there and took a picture. A huge tree came down and went bloop and fell right beside his fence. It didn't hit his house. It didn't hit his roof. It didn't tear his fence down, but it landed right beside his fence. And I said, you have got to be kidding me. Because when you close on it on Friday and then the storm comes through on Saturday night and then all of a sudden you wake up and there's this huge, huge tree laying right there in your yard. You're like, are you kidding me? This is part of where it started. This is um, the area in Nelson that was hit was near downtown Nelson and near the church. And this was just right around the corner. You can see the church in the background and as I drove around through there, I thought, oh no. So I went down to check on his house. There's another tree in Nelson down. I don't know if it was just straight line wind that came through there, but there was no property damage, just lots of trees and lots of trees laying down. And then when I got down to Lee's house and I went, oh my gosh, we just, there it is. There's part of a big tree that is right before his house. So there's, there's kind of where the damage was and he was right in the middle of that. And it was crazy because honestly, y'all, we closed on it on Friday. And when I pulled up, and this is right behind his house, and, and I pulled up and I was going, are you kidding me? And I just kept, in, kept taking pictures and then I got right to his house and I went, uh-oh. But it landed right beside his house. It did not hit his house. It hit right at his fence line. He has a, a white picket fence in the front yard. There's the tree that came across from his house. And it was huge. It was a huge tree. And that's a tree on Pickens Street that came down. And uh, it was just through that little area. Nelson, Nelson and Ballground both had a lot of wind. And I know a lot of people were without cable service. There's the big tree that landed right. That's that's after they got it up out of the road because it actually came from across the road and landed right in his yard. And I'm so glad that he was living there and not the sweet lady that sold it to him because there's the big tree as it was falling all to pieces. Now that, let's never forget why we celebrated this weekend. Let's never forget that there are families Gold Star families living right in our community that um, don't celebrate Memorial Day quite like a lot of people do. So, so let's always remember those fallen heroes. And uh, we didn't have time to talk about that yesterday. We didn't have time to talk about nothing but bees because it took a lot of time. And uh, oh, I was so happy that they brought me some honey. Now that, I wanna share this recipe with y'all because everybody, every time I post this, 
somebody new asked for the recipe. So I'm going to tell it to you right now, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to write it down. It is. It begins with three sticks of softened butter, four ounces of softened cream cheese. To that you add three cups of sugar, and you beat that up for about two minutes, and then you gently add one egg at a time till you add six eggs. And then to that, you add two cups of plain flour, one cup of self-rising flour, and some vanilla flavoring. That's all it takes to make that amazing cake. That is my Granny Gilreath's recipe. Everybody always asks about it every time I post that cake. And I said yesterday we had a little emergency going on and my buddy needed one for an event and I said, oh, I'll whip you up one. And I whipped her up one and I left it baking in her oven while I went to the historical meeting because I had to, I wanted to be there and hear Miss Janice and her presentation about her daddy. So that cake, again, it is so simple. It literally, three st sticks of softened butter, one four ounce cream cheese softened and it's so easy. You will love it, love it, love it. Now that is my dream. That is my forever dream. I have always had the wants for that car and I wants it more now than I've ever wanted it because I realize as I get old pretty soon, I won't need an old car, but I want an old car. I love that car. Is that not the sharpest car you ever saw in your life? Now, there's nothing like a 66 Chevelle, nothing. And there's a man here in town that I would love to get ride us around in, and his name is Ronnie Cantrell. And we're working on talking to him about cars because y'all know him as the best driver that ever hit Gilmer County. Now this, I'd love to invite everybody to come. We're going to have a grand opening on June the 15th, 11 to 4 at Malone's Pond in Ball Ground. And it's going to be a, a very interesting day because somebody made plans to be out of town long ago and bought a ticket and isn't going to be here, but I'm going to be there. So it's going to be a good day. I hope it's going to be a super busy day. And it's going to be fun. And if you haven't been to Ball Ground lately, come out and join us and just get to know the tiny little city that is growing. It's growing by leaps and bounds, but it's growing in a very controlled way because we have developments that are all walking distance to town, which is really cool. And you can build a house and you can walk to town. And uh, isn't, that a, isn't that a really pretty shot? And uh, Glenn Sly does that for us. He is an amazing photographer. He is an amazing drone master. And uh, he does a really, really good job. So that is uh, a house that we are going to go under contract with tomorrow. So it's a really, really pretty house. That's called the Bainbridge. All the houses in the development are named after cities in Georgia. So you might get an Evans, you might get a Pinehurst, you might get a uh, Vinings. Everybody knows where Vinings is. So but isn't that cool? There's something about drones that just seem to make photography so much better. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And our first family is building right across the street from that. And their house is almost ready. They're just so close. They're so close. They're packing their toothbrush tonight. So yay, 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 yay. You know, when we look back at um, Ball Ground, it has changed. It has grown. For many, many years, all the buildings in town were full of rocks. And that's because one man, I think he owned 12 buildings at one time. Well, he went to be with the Lord, and when he did, his beautiful daughters took over and uh, began to manage either, either selling some of Daddy's businesses or leasing them out. There's still one building in downtown Ball Ground that has rocks in it, and it's right across the street from our office. So if you're in Ball Ground and you happen to wander by there and you look, you're about to learn the history of the rock man. You're not going to learn everything about him because it's not long enough. I wish that Miss Janice could have spoken for three hours because she really told a little bit more about him than people knew. They knew he was a little eccentric. They knew he was a little different. 
and um, he was truly that. But uh, it was so interesting last night, and I was so glad I got to make it. So, so we're going to take a commercial break, and when we come back, you're going to get to you're going to get to visit with Miss Janice Prather, who is the heir, the daughter, one of the daughters. Um, she and Judy get along fabulously, and they manage their dad's. Uh, last remaining business and it is so cool to see this and I hope you're going to enjoy it. So get you a cup of coffee and be back with us in just a minute or so. Whether you're in the mood for chicken strips, a delicious burger, our classic banana split, or an upside down thick blizzard treat, we've got you covered. Hot and fresh food every day, every time. And delicious DQ soft serve make the perfect pair at your favorite place. Not fast food, fan food fast. Your Blue Ridge, Ella Day, and Jasper Dairy Queens are your meet, eat, and treat headquarters. Thank you for choosing DQ, how may I serve you? Georgia Medical Treatment Center now has two locations to bring you the high quality holistic care you've come to know and expect. We treat neck, back, and joint pain with chiropractic care and injection-based treatment without the need for surgery or prescription painkillers. Our medical weight loss program can also provide relief while ridding your body of toxins, pounds, and inches while improving your overall health. Call today for a free consultation, 770-345-2000, or go online to georgiamtc.com. You know, how you feel on the inside yeah. is just as important to me as how you feel on the outside. Oh, Daddy. <laughs> I've grown up, grown, grown up, up in every way, in every way, way care and take care of you. You're my grown up and I know you're there. I'm your grown up and you know I care. Cause it's you and me and me and you. So when you are okay or not okay, I'll take care of you. in the pool, making a masterpiece, or just making memories, writing a great American novel, or writing your term paper that's due tomorrow. Whatever you do in life, Farmers is here to protect it. For all your insurance needs, call Donald Curtis in Blue Ridge. the old city hall so this started this time kind of started um, a couple of things that happened first of all he didn't like having to lock and unlock those four you know different storefronts so what he did is he himself chiseled out the walls between those buildings <laughs> so that when he went in one building he could walk past through all four of them 
and never have to get outside and not have to deal with the locks again. So, you know, call that what you will, but you know, it seemed to work for him quite well for years. Um, then the other thing, the other kind of legend that it started is since he had four buildings, he started buying two vehicles, usually red trucks, that were exactly alike, and he would park them in different places with his idea being he never wanted anybody to know where he was, if he was in a building or not in a building, so we had to do cars so that were just alike so he could have his privacy. People wouldn't interfere with him. Okay, um, and he really continued that tradition of having the two vehicles and parking them different places uh, most of his life. We sold all four of those buildings after he passed, several years later, to a fellow named Chris Cope from Roswell. You may have met him because he's certainly been working on the buildings in Paul Brown and obviously they're very active now. We particularly liked Chris. We had several people that wanted to buy buildings. You know how that always goes. But uh, Judy and I were real novice at this uh, inherited situation that we were in. And we really appreciated that he had such a respect for historical old buildings and he wanted to do good things with them and he wanted to make them viable for the city of Ball Ground to improve. Actually, Chris, in his personal life, had uh, received an award for restoring the home that he lived in in Roswell. And that's how we, we first got to know him. So, and we were so proud because when he started doing the renovations, for example, in the Rock Solly Brewery, he reclaimed everything out of that building and he's repurposed it in there. So that, that made us very proud. Okay, moving on to the mid eighties now, he then <coughs> purchased what was known at the time as the um, Hubbard's Store Building. Now, the Hubbard Store Building, Judy, what's the, it's perched. That's where, and that where perched is right now. Um, when he purchased the Hubbard Store Building, it was in the Hubbard Estate, and Mr. Hart was the executor of that. Kind of an interesting, fun fact about that building, I don't know if any of you ever shopped there, but you know, that was just a dream place to go buy things uh, when you were, your clothing, when you were, when it was open. It was like, when he purchased that building, it was like they locked the door one day and then they just didn't come back. They left everything in there. There were multiple long fur coats, shawls, all kinds of dresses, hosiery, everything. A vast collection of ladies' hats. Um, the lady's hat now belonged to an uh, uh, auction antique dealer. And unfortunately, a lot of the, well, just about all of the fur coats and the dresses and all that stuff were stolen. Um, so that kind of solved that. Now I'm gonna take a little sidebar. In addition to buying that Hubbard store building, uh, about that same time in the 80s, he also purchased the Hubbard Home Place, which you know is just up the hill. And um, they did the same thing there. You know, those three sisters, what were was it? Inez, Cora, and Laura. Laura, and the brother was Weldon. Well, and I don't know what Weldon had done to get in the bad graces of the sisters, but... <laughs> When our dad bought the house, there wasn't one thing that belonged to Welton that was upstairs. Everything that man owned was in the basement. <laughs> and, but they did, they left everything just like it was. I mean, the accessories were out on the uh, tables. 
The bed sheets were still on the bed. Towels still in the closet. Everything was there. Even the Sunday school literature. I bet there's several in this room that one of the Hubbard sisters taught you Sunday school still had stacks of literature from Sunday school that was in there. But that's kind of a fun fact about the, the Hubbard situation. But then um, back to the history part of it. We sold the Hubbard building to a business lady from South Africa. She never really made a go of it and it's since been uh, resold. The home place was sold to former ball ground mayor and state representative, he's passed away now, Calvin Hill, and that's since been resold. Moving on to the late 1980s, he purchased the Hotham building from, well, I mean, this is the way Judy and I refer to these buildings. This was the Hawkham building because he purchased it from the Hawkham estate. Um, currently, in one part of the Hawkham building is Parlor and Main, and the other part of the Hawkham building, a large part of it, has a vast amount of rocks, gems, and minerals, as you may observe from the window display. Um, if Judy and I don't get really old <laughs> before this happens, we really want to do something to have in that building right there that would make it more accessible to the public to view the rocks, gems, and minerals. We're just taking our vitamins every day and hoping that that's going to happen. <laughs> um, the same year that he purchased the Hawkins building, he purchased the cable, what we call the cable building. Now, this is up at the corner as you first enter Ball Ground, currently where Sunshine Life and the Ball Ground Barbershop are. This, for me personally, was the most fun building to go through. First of all, if any of you ever go in the Ball Ground Barbershop, or if you haven't, you need to, because on the back wall is the original cabinet work, and it's stained glass, um, mirrored, it's lit, and that's been in there for I don't know how long. But that was the original section of where the barbershop was. And of course we know that Mr. Ridings was the longtime barber. Now I don't know what Mr. Ridings' plan was, but y'all, when we got in the building, there were bags, paper bags, filled with Hair. Cut hair. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about one or two. <laughs> I'm talking about lots of bags of hair. In my mind, I'm just hopeful that he had the plan that he was going to donate it for a worthy cause. But the problem was it had been there so long it was not suitable for anything except the trash. But... Okay, after we've got the barbershop going on, in the little top part up there, that was the watch and clock repair. Boxes of springs and little gadgets and things that you would use to repair clocks of all kinds. Some of them still had tags on them of who they belonged to and what they needed to have worked on. But that was the clock and watch repair. And out in the main section there, that was the bus depot. Still had nails in the wall with Trailways bus tickets up there. And of course, if you're a bus station, you gotta have a cafe because people are hungry. So they had a little kitchen where they had the cafe. Then downstairs, we had probably what was one of the original uh, bed and breakfast areas <laughs> where people could stay if they needed to be overnight between their bus routes. Or I, we've had um, an old timer that told us that he was quite sure that there were two teachers at Ball Ground School that lived there for a year. Um, neither of them were married and they lived down there together for a year. 
I don't know, but it, that sounds good, especially for somebody retired from education. That sounds like a good plan. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was the cable building. Uh, then in the 90s, he purchased divert, the old diversified manufacturing building from Lowell Vansell. Now, prior to that, that was in the Byers family as the Byers garage. Uh, a fact about that, my elementary school classmate, uh, John Wilson, some of you may know John, he told me, and we wondered about this, he told me that Mr. Vansell had a bunch of the people that worked there, they ran out of some space, and he had them to <coughs> bring a building from a fourth of a mile away and relocate it and attach it to the existing structure. And it is very different because that part that, that's been attached now, it's wood ceilings, wood sides, wood floors. It's different than, than all of the others. But John, according to John, that was quite a feat for them to get that moved and to get it put back together during that time. Um, currently housed in that building and one section is uh, heritage plumbing then in the main section is upstream office suites and then in the end uh, is laurel river gifts and boutique and you may remember from five or so years previous to that it was used as an event venue so that's the uh, diversified manufacturing. Uh, right there, that very same time frame, he purchased the building, we called it the green house, because when he purchased it, it was painted green. So the green house is now where the Dominic's food truck and the, the pizzas are. And um, that has had a successful and good history. It was previously one of the local marble company's offices. Then it, well, it, it may be other things. Some of you may chip in if you know other uses uh, for any of these. But it was also Federal Head Start offices. Uh, it was a cafe, a bakery, an art gallery, and then we sold it to a guy named David Martin, and that's where he started the produce and other things, and he did a lot of renovations to the building. So, they all the buildings in downtown Ball Brown that the rock band <coughs> acquired, and kind of what happened with them. Now, to talk about the rock man as our dad and as a person, probably, the three words that people most often use to describe him would be grouchy, eccentric, crazy. <laughs> he was all of those things at some point in time. But let me suggest that there's also some other words that might serve to describe him. And those would be entrepreneur, financial manager, mathematician, and a self-taught geologist. When Judy and I were talking about this, immediately I said, Judy, we need to think of what are, what's our earliest memories of things that we did? I bet you might can guess what they are. <laughs> Collecting rocks, <laughs> washing rocks, moving rocks, <laughs> arranging rocks, going to rock shows. I mean, this was our life. So those are early memories that you would expect. Some of the things that you might be a little shocked by are some early memories that we had of the knocks on the door at all hours of the day or night when somebody was stranded, their truck was broken down, car wouldn't start, they needed some kind of a part for it, and he would leave and go out, try to get it going. If he couldn't, 
I stopped and he paid the towing bill. He had a stack of IOUs in the office. I mean, stacks of them where people needed parts. They couldn't afford them. He'd do them IOUs. A lot of times when people would come in and they would try to pay him some down on those, he'd go, you just keep it for now. I'll let you know if I need it. He also donated lots of building materials to numerous churches in Cherokee and Pickens County. Um, the, the thing is, he always would say to people, if you ever tell anybody that I did so-and-so, I'll never help you again. And he meant it. He didn't want anybody to know that he had done these acts of kindness and um, had taken care of things. I know one lady told us at a point, now we're doing kind of these sidewalk sales every now and then. One lady came up and told us that uh, her husband had fallen at work and he wasn't able to work for two years and that her dad paid his utility bill for two years. You know, that's a pretty good public service <coughs> doing things like that. But anyhow, that's kind of a different side that, you know, you might not be as familiar with. Um, one of the things that he was most proud of is that in 1976, he, along with others, he, you know, when he was involved, he was front and center. So he was involved in uh, lobbying the General Assembly and Governor George Busby to have Starlight named as the official mineral of Georgia. And that you know, Bob Brown and a lot of North Georgia has one of the richest veins of starlight of anywhere in the world. So that's a, that's a good thing. And actually, Judy had, I know you're familiar with starlight, but we got a really good example out of the store. <laughs> and so I thought you might want to just look at a really good example of a starlight. It's not that they're so valuable, like worth a lot of money. It's kind of like one of those things that's a, uh, a good marvel of nature, of the way that they form. Starlight's a metamorphic rock, but the way that they, and they can go in T crosses, they can do like this one's crossing, they can you know, be in a cylinder, but it's just kind of an interesting rock all the way around. Um, Another thing that he took a lot of pride in was his military service. I don't know a whole lot about it. We found things and, and uh, we know he was in the Army. Y'all know Larry Cavender, he's my age and he's local and he's really into all that kind of stuff. And he's been telling me lots of these stories of where he's been researching and he's found his name and doing this, that, and the other. But I, don't, I said, Larry, one day we're just going to sit and talk about that so I feel comfortable in knowing what's going on there. But he really didn't have much patience with people who were not patriotic. I can tell you that, and he would let them know if they weren't being patriotic. John Kennedy was his favorite president, and if you ever pass by the stores or in there, you may know if wherever he had his office, he always had a picture John Kennedy up on the wall. He also had a picture of John Kennedy in the living room at the house he had bought from the Hubbards. And with all of their final things that he never changed, he had a big picture of John Kennedy on the wall. Um, fortunately for him, by the late 80s and for sure the early 90s, he had been blessed with uh, financial success and so the main thing he had to worry about was focusing on his hobby, collecting rocks, gems, and minerals. He attended just, and we attended, bunches of conventions and rock shows. Now we're not talking about 
local things. We're talking about the regional and the national and the international kinds of things. And it was just real interesting to us that when we would go to these things, because you know you register like you do now to, to attend, we drive up there in those trucks. Sometimes we had to take both of them because he knew he would trade or buy so much stuff. It'd be truck loads that needed to come back. He'd have park reserved parking places right at the front door. And when he'd go into those places, he'd say, these are my people. And the thing is, they would treat him like he was a celebrity. It was a real amusing time with, with all the, the rock collection. Um, he also had really good relationships with geology departments in some of the uh, colleges and universities. Um, we had a fellow from, he was a retired professor from UGA that came to one of the sidewalk sales was it the last one we had or the one before, before that? Before. One before that. And he was excited to meet us and he was telling us stories about how our, the rock man had um, let him bring multiple groups of geology students from the University of Georgia up and had just taken them in and had let them tour <coughs> the buildings and just they had all kinds of, of good times there. Now that doesn't really sound like the way he treated a lot of people locally on the streets, does it? <laughs> so, but, uh, and then when Judy started to West Georgia College, she had a note um, to go, the Dr. So-and-so head of the geology department wanted her to come and see him. Well, she's going, she, what in the world? But she went over there and he just wanted to meet her because um, her dad had told him that she was coming there and he said, let me show you all these specimens that he's given us to use in our geology classes and that kind of thing. So, you know, these were his people. <laughs> the other group of people that he had were the Native Americans. The chiefs and the tribal people, the head people, sometimes in full garb and sometimes not, would come and they would trade, they would, he would buy, sell, but for years, and they came in, not just from the reservation in North Carolina, we're talking from all over the United States, they would come and, you know, they just bonded. It was just, those were his people. <laughs> um, earlier I said, mathematician, I don't know what it was, but he had some kind of a super gift with math stuff. He could figure out, and of course this was of interest to him, it was about money, he could calculate out. If you were gonna put in $5 and 2% and interest, was it better to put it in for a year or two? He could calculate all that kind of stuff in his head before anybody could even get the paper or the calculator out to do those kind of things. Then he did the same way about timber stuff. He was really into land and timber and natural stuff. And he'd get so irritated at Judy and me because we couldn't walk out in the woods and tell him how many trees would be timber bearing <laughs> in an acre. You know, when we're talking about it, it may have been a 200 acre track, but he would look and assess all of that and some of the timber folks told us, he would be out there and he'd say, there's gonna be this many loads of, I don't even know, saw logs, there's gonna be this many of number ones, this many of number twos, whatever. And they said, it was amazing because he wouldn't miss it hardly ever. But he just, something about if it had to do with numbers and looking at stuff, well, actually, Last, last story that we're gonna go on. Two or three weeks before he passed away, Judy and I were weeping and he wanted some stuff from Walmart. Well, he didn't just say, go buy me Listerine, uh, what else, toothpaste, that kind of stuff. He said, on aisle seven, <laughs> Listerine is on the bottom shelf, you get the original, and it's going to be 232 for 
16 ounces, whatever, I don't know. And it's going to, you know, this is it. Then you go to aisle so-and-so and you get the toothpaste. Then you go this, that, and the other. He was calling out these items. I couldn't write them down fast enough. I, mean, I knew not to try to write down what aisle they were on, but I was trying to get the item and how much it cost to be sure because in the end, in his head, he calculated it up and he told you plus sales tax, this is gonna be this amount, don't you pay a penny more. <laughs> and he would have been upset if we, and we would have never told him that there was a penny on that. <laughs> but Judy's comment when we walked out to go to Walmart to get that, I'm so glad you didn't bring up that Walmart has rearranged them. <laughs> <laughs> so, five. Obviously it was a sad day. It was made even sadder by the fact that uh, while we were at the funeral home making the arrangements, every building and his house were ransacked. I mean, it was quite a mess. Um, we're sure that the criminals were probably looking for millions of dollars in cash based on the infamous IRS seizure that had occurred in 1994. I probably should just stop right there because <laughs> there again, I hesitate to expand on it because the stories are much, much more exciting <laughs> than the truth. <coughs> uh, the rumor has it that he hadn't paid taxes for several years the truth was, he paid taxes, but he didn't provide proper documentation to support deductions that he was going to take, or he did take. And this was mainly about pine beetle damage to timber. Mm. In his mind, he knew how much he should be able to take for the deductions, and it was a waste of money to get somebody else to have to prove that. Because after all, some of the property he owned to join the timber company's property, and they had taken the deductions, and they knew what they were supposed to be. But you know that's not really the way the IRS looks at things. So um, the reality was too. There was a local business person that really wanted him to be investigated by the IRS. When after the seizure occurred, we saw a folder of two pages of phone calls and letters that had been sent saying that he wasn't paying the right amount of taxes. They even had interviews and articles that had been written to about him in the paper that they sent in for documentation. So, uh, you know, it was kind of a mixed thing. He knew there was going to be a seizure. He was told. And what he did is he went and got the cash out of banks where he had the cash. And then he took the cash and he hid it in those buildings below the railroad track. So yes, there's, it was totally true that armored trucks came, men came with big, big guns and they went in the buildings and they got a whole bunch of cash and a lot of it was in little bills, and some of it was in big bills. But after it was all said and done, thanks to the wonderful months worth of work that Judy did, the money just bounced out. The money that was in the building was the right amount of money that he had taken out of the banks. So it wasn't like there was just millions of dollars in the bank hid in the stores all the time. Now, you may have heard the rumors about how he paid them a million dollars in pennies and coins. You may have heard that story. Well, now that is a real tender, delicate source of uh, unresolved issue with both Judy and with me because the only coins that were involved in that seizure were ones that should not have been seized. They were a collection of coins, a big collection of coins 
they had wheat pennies, buffalo nickels. What what was the dime? What was, I can't remember the dime and the quarter. Silver dollars. Uh, all all of those. He he collected all of those, and they were in metal containers. And when they started to get those, we offered to pay because. We had to go through. We had to go through money and, you know, sort out. Okay, this is this to me. This is this to save those. But we offered to pay. No, 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 no. Well, when we had our attorney that had to go to the Federal Reserve to sign off on things, again, we said, he said, the attorney said, we will, they will pay. We'll pay all of this. They didn't seem to know what we were talking about, about those coins. So, Coins is an unresolved issue with us, but he did not count pick, uh, pennies that he paid the IRS a million dollars in pennies. That has nothing to do with it. Um, so, um, then, by the way, after all that was done, and Judy did her month's worth of work and got appraisals and documentation, enough to satisfy and make the IRS happy. Um, he got the overwhelming majority of that money had to be issued back to him. Just a small amount was uh, in dispute. Okay, the rock man, our dad, was a colorful character, to say the least. Not all good, but not all bad. One thing that we're quite certain of, he lived a full, happy life, except for the last few weeks of his life, and he lived exactly the way that he wanted to. The day before he passed away, he said to me and Judy, I'm not ready to go. I mean, I've made my peace with God, but I've got so many things that I need to teach you two girls. I don't know what you're going to do. Indicated by the Telus Museum of Geologists and also the Geology Department at the University of Colorado when they came calling on us after his death. <laughs> they had been here before. And uh, this is just a little gold specimen that was found. Our dad found it, and it was out on property that he used to have between here and Freehome. You know where the river bridge is? The, I don't know what it's technically. I'm on the river bridge on property pad, and you can see the little gold fleece in there. I thought you might enjoy that. And you passed around the starlight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Yay. Now that was probably my favorite historical meeting because. I learned so much about a man that I was a little bit intimidated by. A lot of people were. He did have a little bit of a grumpy side, but he was protecting what was his. He was, um, often people thought that he was eccentric and that he had money hidden and this and this and this. And I loved hearing the truth from his daughter about what really happened when the Brinks truck and the IRS came to take the money that they actually thought he owed them. And in hindsight, when they did a review and his daughter produced all the documents that they needed, the IRS had to bring back a lot of his money. And they only kept a small, very small portion. So I love that we now have heard the truth, the whole story. And um, Janice, thank you for doing that. That was amazing. And that was probably, I wish it had lasted longer. I was a few minutes late getting there because of that pound cake I had to put in the oven, but it was worth it. It was really, really a cool meeting. And I hope now when you're walking through ball ground and you go, why is this known as Rock City? Why do people talk about rocks all the time? Well, because the downtown area used to be covered in many buildings with rocks sitting everywhere. And the ladies have done a great job of renting out or selling properties and everything looks very different, but I'm so glad that they maintained that one rock building because we will always be known for those rocks. So get out, come to Ball Ground and get to see the rocks. 
Now, we're also known here around Ball Ground, uh, we're known about rocks, and around LJ, we're known for mountain music. And we're going to share a song by Mr. Uh, J, as y'all know him, and as folks know and love him, as we go off the air today. But I want to remind you, um, we're facing Father's Day. And Father's Day, there will be many families that there's an absent father. There will be many families that have lost a dad who went on to be with the Lord. There are many families that didn't have a dad to begin with. And when we look at a family and the way a family was supposed to be structured, it's supposed to be a mom and a dad and raising your children. To hear how those young women who are now actually uh, retired ladies, how they grew up going to conventions with their dad, walking the mountains and the hills with those dad, it just, it really made me see him very differently because I never saw him as anything but a very strong and stern businessman. And now I see him as a dad. So we are approaching Father's Day and if you're visiting your father's grave and that's all you have are those memories, at least you have those memories. So as we approach Father's Day, if your daddy is still here, will you please do something special with him? Give him a little extra time do something. I was looking at some pictures of um, sweet Eddie Brackett the other day and I thought about what a kind and gentle and precious soul he was and what we would give to have him back. Would you bring him back? Never. Not once they've gone to heaven you wouldn't. But if you're going to be visiting that cemetery, just take those sweet memories with you, spend a little time and reflect on what it was like to grow up with a good dad. We're going to leave you with some music from a pretty good dad. He's a pretty good dad. He's a pretty good guy. He's a pretty uh, amazing, crazy, wild, and nut. But I want to share a photo of a 66 Chevelle because I forgot when I was showing y'all the picture of the black Chevelle, you didn't see the Chevelle before it started being worked on. And this one is being worked on, and uh, it's going to be one of those amazing things. It is a matching numbers 66 Chevelle Super Sport. The only problem with me and this car is it is a four speed. Well, I'm an old lady, and I want an automatic. So I'm still going to be looking, looking, looking for a 66 Chevelle automatic. I want a super sport and I think it was really rare for them to be in an automatic but as you get old and as your knees get old and as you decide that you don't want to shift gears all the time if you know of anybody who might have a 66 Chevelle automatic I would really really like to buy one. In my lifetime I'd like to own just one more but I really do want it to be an automatic. And when uh, Mr. Ella J came dragging the one in from Tennessee, it was a four speed. And I said, well, that's a really nice car, but I really want an automatic. So here we go. Let's go and leave you today with some music that just tells it all. It's all about that mountain life. Don't you think it's time to go Where black bears climb and waters flow Hummingbirds out on the deck Your feet propped up and what the heck You'll love how we live here in these mountains Trip to L.A.J. 
jay and see the bright red Georgia clay from Notley down to Carter's Lake. All oh, the memories to make. So much here for all to see. A land that is so dear to me. Welcome home to all your dreams. Hot rod boards and It's all